Hello everyone, good afternoon. My name is uh, Yanis Kokoris. I'm uh, the co-director of the Competition Law Forum at uh, Deakin and a professor of Competition Law and Economics at Queen Mary University. Um, I'm very grateful that we uh, have today, uh, we organized today a webinar on issues of uh, sustainability and I'd uh, like to say first a few very quick words on uh, what Bickle is and a couple of housekeeping points. And then I'm going to pass on to Michael Hutchings, who will be the chair for our panel event today. Uh, so Bickle is the British Institute of International and uh, Comparative Law and is one of the leading independent research centers for international comparative law in, uh, in UK, Europe, and, and globally. And we aim through research projects, seminars like this one, publications, to be at the forefront of policy development, uh, attempt to influence and inform policy. Uh, and this is one of the reasons, for example, they're actually having this webinar with us uh, today. Um, we have an excellent list of speakers uh, covering um, public enforcers, covering practitioners, uh, covering the judiciary, just to give us an as holistic perspective as possible into this controversial theme of sustainability and competition enforcement. Um, and we have with us uh, Martin Hutchings, who will be the chair of our panel, who is a solicitor and an independent competition law practitioner for over 25 years and has been a member of the CMA for five years. And he's been the founder of the Competition Law Forum, which he will uh, talk to, uh, he will talk about in, in a minute. We have uh, Jackie Holland, who is uh, now at Slaughter and May. And uh, as of May, uh, she's going to be in uh, Clary Gottlieb. So congratulations, uh, Jackie, for, for this change. She has experience in uh, antitrust, merger control, market investigation, state aid, and she has held senior positions at the Office of Fair Trading. Uh, Ioannis Lianos, who is a professor of, of competition law at uh, University College London, and he's now the chairman of the Hellenic Competition Commission. And he, the Competition Commission in Greece and the Dutch one have uh, prepared, have contributed or have created an elaborate study on issue of sustainability. Simon Holmes, uh, he's at the Competition Appeals uh, Appeal Tribunal, and before joining the CAT, he was advising competition law for more than 35 years, and he's also a visiting professor at Oxford University. Dr. Salomi Signal de Ugarte, she's at Hogan Lovells, she's a partner of the Antitrust and Competition Group, and her expertise covers all areas of antitrust and major control cases, in addition to digital economy. So on, uh, on that, uh, with that point, with the introduction of, of our eminent panelists, uh, you will be able to answer questions, to ask questions, and our speakers will answer the questions on the Q&A uh, button that you have on your Zoom. So the questions will actually appear as you type them, and then speakers will be able to, to see them and, and answer them. You can also direct a question to a particular speaker if you would like to. Um, the, we, are, we plan to host this panel event for an hour and 15, which means I have to shut up very, very quickly to allow time for our speakers. Uh, the webinar will be recorded and the recorded may be uploaded on our Competition Law Forum website. On that, I will pass on the floor to Michael. Thank you very much, Michael, for chairing our panel. Uh, Michael, you're on mute. Still, still there we go. There we go. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, thank you all for joining. We have a, 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 a large number of people participating, which is which is great. Um, first of all, just to explain, um, Yanis mentioned the uh, Competition Law Forum was set up about 20 years ago as a think tank uh, for competition law based in the UK, based within the British Institute. Um, it's a closed group membership. Um, members pay a, a fairly significant subscription to belong to it. Um, lawyers and economists mostly. And we have uh, a number of meetings every year where we, where we discuss matters in some depth uh, under the Chatham House rule, which means that no one, uh, the, no one is identified with particular views. And um, it's a high level free ranging think tank. Uh, if anyone's interested in membership, please apply to Yanis or to me. Um, but we decided that this event would be thrown open to a much wider uh, audience of participants because of its um, uh, imp importance and topicality. 
Um, I'm not going to uh, say a great deal about what sustainability covers. Uh, Simon's going to do that in a minute. But the key point and the reason I wanted to do this is that it's quite clear that only a certain amount can be achieved by governments and by government legislation. It is essential for these goals to be achieved for there to be private initiatives. Now, in my time as a, a, a sole practitioner after I left my previous firm, and incidentally, 25 years ago, I, I was with what is now Hogan Lovell. So uh, Salome has re um, uh, replaced after a time my position in the Brussels office of, of Lovell's. But when I've been on practicing on my own, I've advised a lot of trade associations. And the trouble with trade associations is that, you know, uh, it's well known, they do, they do bugger all. Um, sorry to coin a phrase, but it's very difficult for trade associations to, to achieve much, mostly because they have people like me telling them what they want to do, they can't do. They obviously can't fix prices and they can't do other things acting together. But the trouble is this has stifled valuable collaboration and I give you one example from my experience, which was at least 15 years ago, when the Secretary of State for Health in the UK wanted the food industry and the advertising industry to get together to restrict the use of sugar, salt and fat in food. And we went away and thought about it. And we would like to have had some sort of exemption from the competition authorities to be able to do that. It clearly wouldn't work if it was UK only, so it would have to be Europe wide. And of course, the exemption procedure had been abolished. And that initiative, which should have happened, never happened. Now that wasn't climate change, it wasn't sustainability, but it was clearly something of societal benefit. And since then I have been pushing this in a number of areas, particularly in the food area. Uh, and I do think that COVID has obviously accelerated this, but, but for the last few years, climate change has been the, the, the key imperative. And that's really why, why we're sitting here. It is coincidental that the UK and Italy are hosting COP26, the 26th UN Climate Change Conference this year. That is coincidental. This is a topical issue. We need to discuss it. So what we need to do is uh, talk about why governments can't do this. It can't do it because consumer behavior is too complex because governments don't understand the complexities in most supply chains. Uh, there's often no consensus political view. There's often not enough parliamentary time. There's a whole host of reasons why governments can't achieve all these things that we as society think need to be achieved. So we've got to make sure that the private sector comes to the party and is able to collaborate and, and work with governments to achieve these objectives. Um, one of the sad things I think about the loss of exemption procedures, both in Brussels and in the UK at roughly the same time, was that there is no obvious means to get a, a get comfort when you do engage in these uh, collaborative initiatives. And it's gonna take a, a, a very considerable comfort to get the in-house counsel of the big companies to engage in the sort of collaboration we're talking about. There have been too many cases where they've been wrapped over the knuckles or fined tens of millions of euros um, to make it very difficult for them to, to come to the party. So we've got to get over that. And that's really why we're here today. Um, and uh, one of the reasons I wanted Jackie Holland on, on the panel was because uh, she was uh, at the OFT at the time when they introduced a thing called the short form opinion which should have been uh, a very useful tool in this, in this uh, process, but uh, sadly, not very much use. I hope she'll talk about that later. So we, we, we've got a fantastic panel. Uh, I, I don't need to introduce them again because Yanis has done that. The procedure we're gonna follow is I'm gonna ask Simon, who's done a great deal of work in this area, which he'll tell you about both with the OECD and working with a climate change um, uh, uh, NGO, but he will set the scene and raise some of the key issues. And I'm, you'll be glad to hear, not, we're not going to have speeches after that. I'm going to ask targeted questions to each of the three other panelists. Uh, and I will turn off my mobile so it doesn't make that horrible noise. And uh, without further ado, I shall pass the baton on to Simon. But please, audience, please send us questions because we will be, uh, we are here to uh, respond to the questions you all have. So Simon, if that's all right, I shall hand over to you and I shall mute again. Thanks, Michael. 
and hopefully I'm not on mute. Um, I think I'd start by saying that, uh, like Michael, I spent many, many years in private practice. And towards the end of my time there, I became increasingly conscious of a certain tension between my work as a competition lawyer, which I don't resile from, but the tension between the, comp the world of competition, the process of competition, which is encouraging everyone to use more resources, often on an unsustainable way, and sometimes it involves a sort of race to the bottom. The tension between that and my work on environmental issues, and of course, growing awareness by everyone um, of the climate crisis. So I spent much of the last couple of years thinking, writing and speaking about how competition policy can take account of environmental sustainability issues. When I started looking at this, there was very little on it. It was a low profile issue, although there was actually some notable exceptions and some excellent work. But now I'm pleased to say it's one of what I would say the two hottest issues in competition law, the other being the digital agenda. So I think conditions are good for change, but immediate caveat, never underestimate how conservative the competition establishment can be. Now, I'm not going into a lot of details today. As Michael mentioned, I've written quite widely on this. My paper in, in the um, Oxford Journal of Antitrust Enforcement is the nearest I've ever come to writing a formal paper, although you could, some would say that's a pretty low bar in my case. But that does set out that, that I, my, how I think we have the, already have the necessary legal tools under European law to accommodate sustainability concerns. Paper in the ECLR looks at that in the UK and also um, tries to draw some lessons from COVID-19. And for those who like something shorter, a short note I did for the OECD roundtable on sustainability and competition policy um, summarizes some of those views. And I know that's going to be put in the chat um, or in the Q&A in, in, in a moment. Today, I want to just keep, keep at a fairly high level, uh, identifying the key issues. My central concern, which in line with what Michael has said, is really how competition law risks, in Michael's words, stifling vital collaboration, although I personally prefer the term cooperation, and give an idea of where we got to at the moment. Now, sustainability is relevant potentially to all areas of competition law in the widest sense. Cooperation between businesses, and I'll come back to that, that's for me top of the agenda, but also it can be relevant to abuse of dominant position, both as a sword, potentially to attack unsustainable, unfair practices, sometimes as a shield, something which might otherwise be considered to be abusive is actually objectively justified when you factor in the sustainability um, elements. Exceptionally, and I don't think it's going to be the case in most cases, um, um, it can be a factor in merger control. And my paper set out five ways in which I think merger control can take factor in sustainability considerations, both positively as a factor in favor of the merger and negatively um, as a factor against a merger. State aid should never be forgotten. The European Commission estimates that we need to spend an extra 260 billion a year in the next decade. And a lot of that is going to have to come from, uh, it's, a lot of that will come from the public sector. Some of it will take the form of state aid or subsidies as we should learn to call them in the UK. At the highest level, that means eliminating or at least reducing support for fossil fuels and increasing support for um, particularly for renewables. And I'd also mentioned public procurement, often forgotten when in a discussion of competition law, but in the widest sense, it's a vital part of competition policy. It's been estimated, I think, by the, I, I, the IMF or WTO, sorry, I forget which, that the public sector spends 13 trillion worldwide each year. Now, if that was used to help green the economy, that has a vast potential. It's not something we'll be talking about today, but um, greening the public procurement rules, to my mind, is something very important. Um, I, I have a book with others coming out next week on this subject, and there are chapters, articles discussing each of those to say we won't be going through them today. For good measure, I'd also mention in the UK, the market investigations because I think there is potential for the CMA to use market investigations to investigate how certain unsustainable practices might have an adverse effect on competition. It's a very broad and flexible tool. But top of my list, as I said, is cooperation, top of Michael's list as well. There's no getting away from it. We face an existential crisis, and I'm not ashamed to use that expression in this context. This means we need to use all our legal and policy tools that we have available. 
As Commissioner Vestaya has said, everyone is called upon to make our contribution to the necessary change, including competition enforcers, including everybody, including business. Now, I've under no illusions, regulation is often the most appropriate and sometimes the first choice policy tool. But as Michael has mentioned, it's not always um, doing the job. It's sometimes too slow, it's limited in scope, or to be honest, it's just limited in ambition and business is often prepared to go further and quicker. And again, of course, companies can and do compete on, their, on the sustainability of their products. My product's more sustainable than yours, come and buy my product. But all too frequently, businesses suffer what uh, is sometimes called the first mover disadvantage. Not always. It, sustainable products may be more costly. Again, not always. As a result, a company may have a competitive disadvantage. Again, not always. It depends on what's often called the willingness to pay. And even if some consumers, like I suspect most people on this call, are prepared to pay a few more pence or cents for a product, frankly, it's, that is not sufficient in itself in most instances. It will, in many instances, that is not going to be, or often is not, on a sufficient scale or at a sufficient speed to really make the transformational change that we need. So often businesses need to cooperate to move things faster and further. And that's where competition law comes in. Before I come to that, in case I forget, I would in that context um, commend to everybody the submissions by people like Unilever to the European Commission in the context of the review of the horizontal guidelines, where they set out literally dozens of the sort of things that industry can and must do, but which risks being inhibited by competition law. My paper set out that my belief that we already have the basic legal tools to do this. For example, um, I set out five ways in which I think um, agree, a bit, sustainability agreements may avoid the prohibition in Article 101 of the treaty or the Chapter 1 prohibition under the UK Competition Act. Now, I'm not going into any of that today. I'll just give you one example, though. The first condition for an exemption from competition law, if an agreement is potentially it is caught by the basic prohibition, for an exemption, an agreement must contribute to improving the production or distribution of goods or to promoting technical or economic progress. Now, so many people focus on economic progress and quite rightly, economic progress is vital, but it's not the only thing there. All too often people start asking questions, well, you know, it, can we get non-economic factors into this? Well, you don't need to. Many sustainability initiatives will be economic progress. In fact, I suspect most, but that's not the only one. What about the other three limbs? People seem to forget them. Improving production, agreements using fewer resources, improving distribution, sharing the distribution logistics, promoting technical progress, developing new green technologies. And the European Commission and other competition authorities in the past have taken a much more holistic approach to this. We seem to have had a low point since around 2000 in this area, and I'm hoping we can get back to a more holistic and realistic um, approach in this area. But as Michael has mentioned, it's the fear of competition law that is inhibiting much of this. And I'd emphasize, I don't think it's the competition law itself or what the competition authorities are actually doing I don't know of cases where they've been fighting genuine sustainability agreements. The nearest I can think of off the top of my head is the action by the US authorities against um, four companies trying to improve emission standards. But it's widely believed that that was politically motivated by a certain former recent um, president and the case has been dropped. And one survey by a major law firm, which I think I'm allowed to mention, I think later, found that nearly 60% of businesses said that they had shied away from sustainability projects for fear of competition. And for many years, the European Parliament has been urging the European Commission to make things clearer uh, and to make it less likely that competition law stands in the way of uh, vital initiatives. I could speak to many examples from my own practice. Now, perhaps I'll just mention two. I spent some years working for the Waste and Resources Action Programme, the UK body um, with tasks with increasing the UK's rate of recycling and reducing the amount of plastic packaging and food waste. Now that needed cooperation between suppliers and retailers to move things forward. And it's done so. Initiatives like the Cortelbs initiative. But I always felt that that progress could have been quicker 
and could, we could have been more ambitious if companies weren't constantly nervous of competition law. And understandably, given the lack of positive encouragement from the competition authorities. And a more recent example, um, in my client Earth, with whom I have some, uh, for whom I, to whom I give some assistance, uh, they've been helping the Sustainable Fish Alliance or some, sorry, that may not be exactly the right title, apologies. Um, but basically, a group of suppliers and retailers trying to ensure that we don't overfish to the point of um, extinction and many fish species. They just want to ensure that fish are fished on a sustainable basis. And at one point, one of the major retailers declined to sign up to an agreement. And they said, well, this looks like a collective boycott. We're agreeing not to source from unsustainable sources. And I understand at a superficial level, it did look like that. But I assure you, when you look at it in the round, this really wasn't a competition law risk. And I've discussed this with senior competition officials. And they said, Simon, that's not the sort of thing that we'd have a concern with. But my point is here is that, yes, it's all very well somebody saying that to me privately after a nice dinner or a couple of beers. But they need to say this publicly and we'll come back to what the authorities can and should be doing. I think Jackie in particular will, will speak to that. Um, and finally, I have to say that nobody advocating for a, a competition law accommodating better sustainability issues is advocating any form of greenwashing. That seems to be a sort of reflex reaction from some who are looking for excuses to um, obstruct this. If car companies fiddle the emissions or agree not to compete on environmental standards, the full force of competition law should apply. If light bulb manufacturers agree not to develop more efficient light bulbs, same again. But if those light bulb manufacturers agree perhaps to phase out um, uh, short, short light bulbs of a short life, then that ought to be okay. And indeed, I take that as an example because the OFT said as much in a submission to the OECD uh, when it had a round table years ago, 2010, on sustainability and competition law. To the extent that greenwashing is an issue, and I'm sure somebody can find some examples of it, my view is that it's actually a consumer law issue. There are, I, I think there is plenty of the need for action against un, unjustified claims by companies about the sustainability of their product, but that's a consumer law, not a competition law issue. And the authorities are, taking action in that, the Dutch um, and indeed the UK recently. So where have we got to? Well, the national authorities are really, national competition authorities are really leading the charge. The leader of the pack, the leaders of the pack, I should say, are the Dutch and the Greeks. And Yanis uh, will be speaking about that later. The French and the UK are moving along, I think, in the right direction. Um, for example, the UK has said that its strategic priority includes climate change and supporting the transition to a low carbon economy. And I note that even uh, to literally today, and um, thanks to uh, uh, th that it said in its updated merger guidelines that um, sustainability could be taken into account um, potentially as a relevant customer benefit in UK merger control. First time I've seen that. It's certainly something I've been calling for. Um, other countries are to a great extent looking to the European Commission to, to lead and understandably so. Industry is, is getting more and more involved with the issue. I've already mentioned Unilever and there are other companies doing some great work in this area. To known would be another example. I had the privilege of chairing a working group at the International Chamber of Commerce and we put out a paper on this subject as well. International bodies are also coming back to it. Um, for a short period before I was sacked because of Brexit, I was a, a non-governmental advisor to the European Commission for the ICN. And I asked, where does sustainability fit in? I'd like to be involved with that, please. And they said, oh, well, it, sorry, it doesn't really fit into any of our working groups. A bureaucratic, technocratic response. It just was not on the agenda. Now, I'm pleased to say it is. Things of, That seems like light years away. It's actually only 18 months away. Go. The OECD has had a round table on sustainability and competition policy before Christmas and another meeting uh, last month. And the European Commission, and we're all waiting to see where they go. We're hearing the, the right things, I think, the right sort of things from the top, Commissioner Vestaya and Olivier Guérissant. We need to see how that translates into action and policies. I think that many of the long-serving officials at the Commission are, shall we say, somewhat more conservative, and I'm a little nervous um, because of that. Um, 
And I've already mentioned that they're consulting on their guidelines, and I'm confident now that there now will be something on sustainability in those guidelines. I've forgotten the percentage, but a majority of, the, of all the submissions to the Commission for the revision of the horizontal guidelines were on sustainability, which just shows how it, high it is on the agenda. The concern is no longer whether there will be something in that, but how useful they will be. They may be um, the lowest common denominator and very conservative, but let's see. And the Commission more recently has been consulting on competition policy uh, and the Green Deal. And again, there was a conference on that um, last month. But never underestimate how conservative the competition establishment is. I could talk a lot, and I better, better not, about the influence of the Chicago School of Economics, but um, clearly I think it's got a lot to answer for. But actually a greater concern at the moment to me um, is what I call the it's all too difficult brigade. And that is people who purport to be sympathetic to the issue, but seem to go out of their way to find reasons why um, it's all too difficult from it's a slippery slope to, oh, it's not in line with the economic approach. And there are answers to all these questions. And some of the objections are frankly quite absurd. And I've tried to set out responses in, in my papers. So in conclusion, there are genuine difficulties here. I don't resile from those. Um, I haven't gone into the details today, but and there are gen the legal ones such as which consumers should we take into account when applying the second condition for an exemption uh, under Article 1013 or exemptions from the Chapter 1 prohibition. There are real issues there, but there are answers. And I suspect Yanis, if he's talking about the Dutch proposals, may come to those, for example. There are economic ones. Exactly how should we take into account so-called out-of-market efficiencies? Again, there are, it's a genuinely difficult area. We need a constructive discussion. But top of the difficulties, I think, is just the inherent conservatism in the uh, competition establishment. But as I say, we have the legal tools already. I hope my papers help to uh, set those out. Others have done so as well. I should have flagged when I mentioned my papers, excellent papers by many others, like, for example, Moritz Dolmans or Jordan Ellison. But we need to change the way we use the tools we have. And we need to take steps to have better guidance uh, from the authorities, better worked exam better examples, test cases and so forth. And I think we'll come back to that in the discussion. Things are moving in the right direction, but we need to keep up the pressure on the European Commission, um, on the member states, and member states need to keep up the pressure on the commission. Again, I defer to Yanis on that. And industry needs to continue making the sort of efforts that we're seeing. And there's a vital role here for lawyers and indeed economists in helping with that um, pressure and movement. And final word, in also giving realistic and robust advice to clients, whether you're an in-house lawyer or an external advisor. And I'll pass back to Michael. Simon, that was great. Really good. And I, I apologise for not having done the little advertisement earlier for your book, which I can... Um hold up there which I hope you can see um, uh, Simon is one of the uh, one of the editors of this major work published by Concurrence on competition law climate change and environmental sustainability so there uh, that you will find uh, a host of uh, very well respected commentators contributing to that publication and I know one or two of those contributors are on the participants list today um, you've raised a whole lot of issues um, I'm going to come to Jackie second, but but when Jackie speaks, it does make me think that one of the things that you alluded to is government intervention to make it easier for for what you prefer to call cooperation. But I think it's very instructive that the Competition Act in the UK has a provision, but most of us knew nothing about it because it was never used until guess what a year ago, because of COVID, and they introduced three exemptions, one for the private hospitals to collaborate with the NHS, one for some really obscure thing. I think, was it the Isle of Wight Ferry or something really obscure? But the major one in an area which I'm familiar with was groceries, allowing grocery supermarkets to collaborate about opening hours and about delivery mechanisms, all sorts of useful stuff. And it takes me back to the time more than 10 years ago when I was heavily involved in the CMA or Competition Commission inquiry into, into grocery supermarkets. And at the end of that, we should have ended up with some arrangement under which uh, steps were taken to appoint 
uh, some sort of regulator now called an adjudicator to regulate dealings between supermarkets and their suppliers. Everyone knew it was a good thing. Everyone knew it had to happen. But would it happen? No, because it would have meant those guys sitting around a table together. So it took another three years and eventually an act of parliament was, was adopted, uh, setting up the office of grocery code adjudicator. But it's ridiculous that the or the, 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 the private sector feels so stifled. Now before, so Jackie can start preparing on that while, while we turn to Salome, because I, I, I do want to make sure that we uh, don't make this too uh, parochially UK specific and Salome is anything other than UK specific. Um, but but uh, Salome, Simon has quite rightly referred to the, um, the, 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 the benefit test for exemption under Article 101, and commonly uh, the shorthand is the consumer welfare test. Consumer welfare has over the years been more and more narrowly um, uh, treated and is, is really seen as being something to do eventually with price. And of course, as Simon has pointed out, there are a whole lot of other things that should be brought into account, including improving production and distribution and so on and so forth. And I really want you, if you could, to talk about this consumer welfare test and how we can persuade competition authorities to move away from that or to, to broaden the, the way it's perceived and indeed then encourage the private sector to, to go along with that. So over to, over to you, Salome. Okay. Well, thank you, Michael. And uh, well, first of all, thank you very much, Ami, for having me here today. I'm really delighted to be the non-UK element. Uh, well, not only, I mean, we have uh, also a Greek element here, so, but to be the European uh, part of the discussion. Um, perhaps, um, I mean, sustainability is, is actually really at the top of the agenda. And, and just to, to give you um, an idea of how topical that is, as we speak today, there is a discussion at the level of the EU Council with the environment ministers where they are talking about the European Green Deal and climate targets. So, you know, this is something that is on top of the agenda of governments, but also on the EU. And you referred to the private, uh, private sector and also business or companies, our clients are really very concerned about that. And they want to make an impact. They want to be um, play a, a clear role in this in this uh, sustainability drive, and this is why many of our company, many of the of the clients we are working on, are already dealing, um, you know, with ESG, with sustainability targets, and the boards are already quite involved in this discussion. So, in the but in the particular context now of of competition law. Um, it is true that sustainability, and I think that Simon already quite uh, well explained it and, and, and told us how the, the debate is being portrayed. But in the last months, I would say, it has really grown in terms of prominence. And this is not just because of the number of consultations, papers, guidance issued by the European Commission, but also other competition authorities. Um, this is also because it is ultimately there is a need um, to deal, there is a need to provide advice, to provide some guidance to indeed unable, as you were rightly saying, unable the private sector to really get involved and be able to, to do something. Um, I think that, um, you know, we, 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 we can have discussions, we can, we can say, but we all basically recognize that, um, you know, tackling these uh, environmental and sustainability challenges will require you know, massive corporate action and industry-wide collaboration, um, as Samo was saying. So, and not just at national level, it has to be at European level and occasionally as well at global level. So we are talking here about cross-border initiatives and we are talking here about um, if actions that companies are, are really taking across industries are trying to increase uh, the work uh, together to drive and you know set up initiatives and we are already working on a number of these um, initiatives with some of our clients and you can I mean there are a number of, of examples out there but just to give you an idea to give you um, um, a perspective of the kind of, of uh, agreements that are being negotiated or, or at least discussed is um, research and development agreements or joint research and development agreements to try to develop less polluting uh, technologies. 
There are also agreements to uh, commit to minimum standards uh, for manufacturing. Um, there are also initiatives to try to agree on phasing out less sustainable but uh, cheaper products and replace them with more sustainable at alternatives that have, I mean, in turn, a higher price. Um, in all this, the real, the real risk is, as was already portrayed quite, uh, quite well, is that these initiatives could negatively impact consumer choice and low prices in the short term, and therefore, uh, therefore uh, fall foul of, of, of you know, the current competition law dictates and the current uh, theories of harm that we use. This is ultimately why I believe, and, and, and I think this is ultimately what you want me to deal with, why uh, that antitrust role has to play a clear role to promote rather than hamper a sustainability initiatives. This is the only way uh, to allow the private sector and really the, the, the corporates to take action and increase collaboration. The problem in this is that, as you rightly say, traditionally competition law has been focusing on protecting consumer welfare and the legal theory of harm usually looks at the more short and perhaps medium term timeline. But sustainability is quite different. Sustainability would bring, I mean, the, the analysis or involving sustainability requires us to take a much broader set of constituents. So it's not just about consumers, it's about the wider benefits. It's about taking a much longer term view than competition regulators would usually take. To me, this is indeed the crux of the problem. This is the key issue in the whole uh, framework of legal analysis. And this focus on uh, consumer welfare, and in particular, on the effects of these corporate, uh, cooperation initiatives on prices in the, in the near future, and for the direct consumers of the particular product and services needs to change. So this is, to me, a very narrow approach that we'll have to move, we'll have to, um, we'll have to develop. It's uh, with this, this kind of narrow approach would uh, make it really very difficult to have or to defend a joint sustainability initiative that as a result of which there, re there would be benefits for the whole, for a wider society, not just to a couple of, uh, or a certain group of consumers, but would lead to higher prices um, for direct consumers in the, in the short term. Um, you can't, if you can't take into account the wider benefits of a particular initiative, then the, the, there is a real problem. So to me, the shift and the policy shift that we need and that has to take place and which antitrust authorities should uh, explore in terms of the legal theory of harm is um, whether we, uh, whether, well, competition authorities would like to become a bit more flexible and not only take into account the benefits for direct consumers in the short term, but also the benefits for the wider society, including over a longer period of time. This is to me essential. And in addition to this, what we need is also, in, so in addition to this, this flexibility, we also need the appropriate legal tools to um, quantify those benefits, to really measure the benefits um, calculate the efficiencies and also be able to determine how they stack up against the potential detrimental effects, um, price-wise in particular, for the direct consumers in the short term. And so just, and I believe that some of the competition authorities, and we will hear in a minute, uh, yes, um, seem to be willing to take that path and to and more flexibility in, the, in their approach, not all of them. And this is the other problem. So the, the other problem is that we need a consistent, we need a harmonized approach and ideally throughout Europe. So not just by one uh, particular member state. I, let me just conclude with one um, additional note uh, because it was also referred to by Simon. Um, we, I mean, most of the debate is primarily prim uh, around sustainability related issues under article 101, but um, environmental considerations are really, um, part of the legal assessment and have been for a long time in the, in this, in the, in the context of state aid, state aid control and, um, and are also now increasingly under discussion and merger control and in particular cases in this area. 
And also this, uh, also finally, just to say that um, sustainability has been, has popped up in a case of abuse of dominance uh, this very week, where the European, uh, where the, you know, the press release and the European commissioner specifically said, uh, referred to, the, this is the PPC case in, in Greece, where it, uh, Commissioner Vestea said, said, and I'll quote, um, that might, I mean, this uh, behavior might have distorted competition and slowed down investment into the generation of greener energy. So just to conclude, I think this, uh, these are really interesting times and there is a lot to be done and, and hopefully we can continue our discussion, I mean, on this, on this later. So thank so you. Salome, that's fantastic. And just to warn uh, Yanis that um, I'll come to you after Jackie, but uh, I, I hope you will very much deal with this issue about uh, needing a harmonized approach. I mean, that's, that's for heaven's sake, absolutely um, uh, central to this, this whole issue. Um, one other point, Salome, I'd come back on is the, this definition of consumers. I mean, I think progress has been made. Um, it, it was debated all those years ago in the in, in the grocery supermarket inquiry in the UK, and it was recognised that consumers do include people who aren't actually themselves customers, because it includes people who live in care homes and uh, who, who have their shopping done by someone else. It includes people who aren't car drivers. It also includes potentially overseas farmers, and there was a, a strong group of NGOs representing overseas farmers in that inquiry uh, because they weren't directly uh, concerned with the inquiry because they weren't suppliers in the UK. So there is a recognition that the term consumer has got to be given a wider, a wider uh, definition as well as expanding it beyond, as Simon was talking about, beyond the economic context. So I think we'll come back to that. Um, but I would like to turn to Jackie and I, Jackie, you know, I've mentioned the short form opinion, you know, why is it that the UK authorities and possibly other authorities have not developed a procedure to enable private initiatives to happen more sensibly and with some sort of comfort? And it's got to be more than some sort of comfort. It's got to be pretty good comfort because, you know, you're not going to get the Unilevers of this world. I quote them because someone's mentioned them. I'm not gonna, you're not going to get the Unilevers and Proctors and Gambles of this world to come to sit round a table uh, unless they have pretty much watertight comfort. And, and this is what we're talking about. And we're talking about big issues here. So, you know, you've, you've, got, you've got to make this worthwhile. So, Jackie, over to you on that, please. But, but do expand, expand beyond that uh, as you wish. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Michael, for asking me to participate today. Um, so I expect some of you are probably thinking, what on earth is a short form opinion? Um, well, this was a tool that was developed in 2010 while I was at OFT, um, really in an earlier iteration of some of this sustainability debate. There were a lot of concerns around that time um, that competition law was having a chilling effect on beneficial cooperation arrangements. Many of the examples people gave um, were in the sustainability space, for example, initiatives to reduce packaging or plastic bags, etc. Um, the essence of the tool is that it was like a shortened version of the EC guidance letter procedure or the UK opinion procedure. Um, the idea was to create a, a tool whereby the businesses could provide a joint statement of the key facts and the question they had on compliance with competition law. Um, the agency would not investigate the facts, which can take some time. It would assume they were correct and would publish um, the statement of facts and an opinion on the legal question based on the facts. So on the assumption that they were indeed correct. So it was quicker because um, it would be done without an investigation of the facts and information requests and data analysis. Um, to qualify for it, the agreement had to be a prospective agreement rather than implemented. It had to raise some form of novel or unresolved question that would be of interest to a wider audience um, and have a material link to the UK. Um, the point about it having interest to a wider audience was really about the use of agency resources because there wasn't a justification for the agency to dedicate resources to provide a private advisory service to one particular business or group of businesses 
So the idea was that the, um, the opinion would provide guidance to a wider range of businesses in the wider community. So the pros of the tool were that the businesses could get some guidance in advance before they'd committed to the project. Um, they were also expressly given the chance to respond to any concerns expressed by the OFT so they could make changes if they were advised that a particular term might be problematic. Um, and that this SFO, this short form opinion, would give guidance to others. Um, the downside, um, uh, one was that it would had to be non-binding on the agency at a later stage, although the agency would have regard to it. The reason for this is obviously it could turn out later that the facts given by the businesses were not correct or they didn't give some relevant information and there was a concern about um, the agency binding itself um, in terms of a later potential action. Um, downside or upside, depending on how you look at it, but I think from a business perspective, possibly a downside was the publicity. So the opinion would be published with the facts. And then another downside potentially was persuading the agency to prioritize the request since it was discretionary work from the competition agency's um, perspective. Um, there were two short form opinions published by the OFT. Um, but neither, sadly, were in the sustainability space. Um, uh, it was a source of great disappointment to me personally at the time that we weren't inundated with requests for short form opinions in the sustainability space. But there was one published on joint purchasing and there was one on effectively a proposal to um, price fix in relation to way leaves for broadband in rural areas. Um, the CMA adopted the procedure on a trial basis in 2014 and said that it might be available for a few cases a year, but I'm not personally aware of any short form opinions having been issued since then, and I don't think the CMA is actively pro promoting the tool, um, so it's a bit unclear whether the CMA has received any requests or not, um, or whether you know they did receive some requests but they weren't prioritised. Um, so. <laughs> Why was the tool not so successful in helping all these sustainability initiatives? Well, we don't have any research here, so I'm guessing. I think the first one, um, it could be that businesses didn't find the tool very valuable. Probably the non-binding nature of the opinion was a bit off-putting. Um, possibly the publicity element that the businesses didn't like the idea of the initiative um, going on to the agency's website. Um, another reason could be that the CMA has chosen not to prioritise requests, perhaps um, uh, focusing discretionary resources in other areas such as antitrust enforcement or consumer protection or market studies. Um, it could be, and it happened in some instances, that the businesses persuaded government to um, introduce legislation or regulation instead with greater legal certainty. Um, for example, the introduction of charges for plastic bags in the UK. Um, and it could also be that com competition law is, was not the real barrier to some of the agreements in question. There might have been commercial deterrence too. Um, I'm not sure what the real justifications are, but they all could be some explanations. Maybe it's a combination of all of them. So in terms, if we think for looking forward, what tools could be used to achieve legal certainty? Um, there's definitely the government action, there's legislation, regulation, we've had plastic bag charges, I just mentioned, we've had the sugar tax in the UK, um, there could be subsidies to encourage individual action rather than cooperation initiatives. Um, there is the possibility of an exclusion order, as Michael was alluding to earlier, so a particular beneficial sustainability agreement, why not issue an exclusion order providing complete legal certainty? Or perhaps even a UK block exemption for agreements supporting the sustainability agenda. Um, the CMA has already issued a, a sort of an information guidance um, on how to apply the law to sustainability. I do wonder whether the CMA could do more in that area in the future. Um, perhaps give more detailed case study style guidance as has been done by the um, Dutch agency and by other initiatives elsewhere. 
Um, this would require a lot of cooperation, I think, with the business community, perhaps some of the sub submissions that Simon's mentioned were put in in relation to the horizontal review in Brussels to identify some good case studies of potential agreements to be included in the guidance that would be of interest to other people. I think one particular area that it would need to cover are the information exchange rules, because I think in practice, as a, a lawyer in private practice, that is perhaps the area that causes the most confusion in, and is potentially the biggest deterrent to some of these initiatives going ahead. Um, it will also need to um, cover the application of the exemption criteria to sustainability agreements. Um, will there be more short form opinions? I still, I'm very biased having thought up the, the tool in the first place, but I still think the tool has some merit. Maybe it will come back, who knows? Um, and then finally, I was just going to say the other option that has been referenced a couple of times already is um, merger control can provide legal certainty for some cooperation agreements that uh, fall within the definition of um, the relevant merger situation in the UK or a full function joint venture in Brussels, um, because there you can get an approval for the merger as well as any ancillary restrictions. So that can be helpful for some sustainability initiatives. So I'm thinking there probably that's bigger projects such as joint ventures to build renewable energy generation, et cetera. So there's some ideas going forward, Michael. <laughs> well, that, no, that's great, Jackie. And a question we might come back to, because I want to move on to Yanis, but a question we might come back to is, how do we change the culture? I mean, a lot of these issues will be in the hands of uh, in-house lawyers. And I, I suspect that in-house lawyers uh, are, are bound to be cautious by nature. And uh, a lot of these issues won't even find their way to the likes of, of you and Salome in, 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 the, in specialist firms. And so we do need to change culture. And I think that's something that Simon alluded to. And we might come back to that question. But um, Yanis, let's turn to you because, you know, inevitably, and I think what Jackie said has put, put a finger on this, however much we would like to see more private initiatives doing stuff and achieving things, we are going to have to look to the authorities to do a lot of the heavy lifting. <clears throat> when I say the authorities, the competition authorities in collaboration with governments. And so um, can I turn to you? And uh, you, you, I know, are, have, have done a lot of work on this area. So uh, uh, and, and again, not just in the, uh, a national perspective, um, but an EU perspective as well. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Michael. Um, definitely, this is one of the major uh, challenges uh, competition authorities uh, will have uh, in this context. Um, and um, obviously, we are facing a complex situation in the sense that, uh, you know, we, we have this need for more legal certainty uh, coming out of business because of the fact that the, uh, the uncertainty, the inherent uncertainty, let's say, of the benefits of investment in this context uh, and the considerable cost of uh, these investments for, for instance, renewable uh, energy uh, projects. Uh, so that somehow uh, creates issues with regards to, um, you know, the corporate financing of the transition to the green uh, economy, which might be more problematic in some countries than um, in others. So, I mean, there is a, a cost basically for the green transition uh, and of course, you know, the main actor here will be uh, public investment, I think is absolutely important, but uh, because of the uh, importance of the task and the, the transformational basically purpose of it, uh, will need to, uh, that will need to be also supported uh, by uh, private um, investment. Uh, and to a certain extent, this might not be easy, uh, as it might be difficult to assess climate disruption risks and the incentives of some of the business actors might be affected also by the legacy investments they have made in the past uh, in non-environmentally friendly production processes, with the result that, uh, you know, in case, you know, we move to a, and probably quickly uh, to, uh, to the green economy, their assets may be depreciated uh, if, for instance, stricter environmental regulation is passed or CO2 emission pricing uh, increases. So there might be some issue of incentives there that needs to be solved. Uh, through some form of smart regulatory uh, intervention. And of course, uh, you know, uh, governments uh, will have different, you know, have uh, policy spaces that are left by the EU. The EU also obviously will need to act as well. 
And if we look to the various governments, we might see that their institutional capabilities or and the possible budgetary space that they might have could be uh, could diverge. So regarding Greece, for instance, because um, I've been we have been working on this issue in the context of the competition authority, uh, the financial uncertainty inherent in such uh, long-term investments is reinforced by additional difficulties. Uh, the first one is that most Greek businesses are of small or medium size, and therefore they will need to scale up in order to achieve the efficiencies needed uh, in this context to produce basically the high returns of the green investments made. And uh, to that extent, you know, what we can foresee is a process of cooperation between them or m and uh, that we'll probably face in the next few years. And secondly, uh, the, the differences, as I mentioned before, in financing capacity are enormous among the EU member states, despite obviously the significant effort done by uh, EU uh, funding in view of the green growth agenda. Uh, for instance, if we think about Greece, uh, in view of the important financial and economic crisis we had during the last decade, uh, the funding gap might be severe here. So an important effort needs to be made to limit uncertainty, in particular regulatory uncertainty, and provide incentives to banks and institutional investors to make these investments for uh, green uh, growth. So obviously competition law is only a small part of the broader regulatory strategy, but obviously uh, in that context, competition authorities might play their role and facilitate uh, this transition to a green economy. And from that perspective, this is what motivated us to reflect on this topic and to issue uh, the staff of the uh, Atlantic Competition Commission a discussion paper uh, back in September uh, 2020. And then uh, we had a, an international conference to obviously come up uh, with uh, specific uh, proposals and uh, discussions also with other national competition authorities in view obviously of the uh, broader EU discussion that uh, was initiated uh, by Commissioner uh, Festager. Uh, and in that context, actually, we uh, had a, a close cooperation with the Dutch Competition Authority uh, to produce a technical report. And the need for that technical report comes out of the fact that, uh, as you know, was mentioned by the previous speakers, one of the important aspects here is to evaluate, basically, uh, what could be uh, these environmental benefits uh, or sustainability benefits and actually let's not forget the sustainability is a much broader concept than just the focus we all have right now on um, environmental sustainability. Uh, and then, you know, we might have, probably will have to do some form of trade-off with other possible um, effects, anti-competitive effects uh, that, that these agreements might, uh, might bring it to figure out basically the way we can assess these. If we talk about uh, one of the examples that was uh, provided by Samo before, uh, the, uh, the way actually we can assess uh, cooperation agreements. Obviously, sustainability is much broader than just that. Uh, in competition law, in particular, our report, uh, the staff discussion paper, was also dealing with the enforcement of Article 102, uh, merger control, and Article uh, 106. So basically, I would say um, uh, one of the issues uh, that um, we, we try to, uh, to focus upon is the way we can uh, somehow use the existing case law, because we think that many of these issues could possibly be solved by having a creative interpretation, obviously, uh, a, 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 you know, an interpretation that uh, uh, is close to the, uh, to the text, obviously, of the, of the case law. Uh, uh, and I think the, the existing case law provides us uh, possibilities. Huh? And uh, to a certain extent, uh, the, the recent case law, I would say, of, or even of the court, uh, is opening up these possibilities. For instance, uh, my reading of the, the API uh, case uh, with regards to, um, you know, possible uh, benefits, let's say, in this context, it wasn't environmental benefits, but it was more or less public policy issues, I mean, in the context of the Walters kind of Mecca Medina uh, case law, uh, as well as the most recent uh, I would say, um, uh, discussions that we had um, uh, in, uh, in Budapest Bank, you know, or uh, in generics uh, about uh, bioobject restrictions competition and the way actually we can uh, argue these. I mean, I think uh, this opens up uh, possibilities uh, to uh, take into account uh, uh, legitimate objectives of, of general interest 
uh, more uh, broadly than what uh, we thought you know was possibly the case uh, in the past. So from that perspective, I mean, I think we can uh, we can have some uh, significant um, uh, improvements here. Uh, obviously, there is the ongoing discussion about uh, the horizontal uh, cooperation guidelines, uh, and in particular, uh, the uh, possibility of including sustainability concerns in the context of Article 101, uh, Paragraph 3. And we follow very uh, closely this, uh, this discussion. So from the point of view of the case law, I will say, I think a, a lot can be, can be done and can be achieved. Uh, and what I think probably might be needed is to have some uh, form of uh, clear guidance uh, to companies in order to uh, enable them somehow to uh, engineer uh, various uh, deals that could uh, fit uh, competition or principles, of course, and promote uh, sustainability. Uh, Yanis, I get to interrupt you because you're, you, you, there's a question from Maurice Dolman, which is just, uh, just, just you need to deal with here. Yanis is spot on. We accept cooperation in R and D in order to deal with possible externalities and long-term costs and risks of innovation. Why not for sustainability? I mean, this is feeding into what you've just been saying. Yes, and I think one of the reasons probably we haven't done this uh, so far uh, systematically might be you know, the issue of measurement, uh, of the evaluation issue, which is actually a complex situation. Uh, and this is also what uh, motivated us to, um, to uh, collaborate with the Dutch and uh, actually commission together a team of uh, both the environmental economists and competition economists, uh, actually all three of them, uh, to, to work uh, on, uh, on a text that will somehow map the different uh, uh, evaluation um, methodologies that are used in environmental economics that could probably be of inspiration for, for competition law enforcement, because most of the competition economists actually were not working within that particular paradigm, and we thought it was very important to bring them together. Uh, and that's why we issued that report. So that report is trying somehow to map uh, issues, but I think uh, what needs to be done uh, possibly is to try to implement uh, these evaluation methods and principles in concrete cases. Uh, and to a certain extent also um, help competition authorities to be part of the, uh, this transformational effort that is actually undertaken right now. And I think one of the possibilities to do that, and this is what we are working on right now, uh, is uh, the development uh, of a, a form of sustainability sandbox. And this is something that we have uh, suggested uh, in our uh, staff uh, discussion uh, paper. And I think obviously uh, the idea of the sandbox uh, uh, is something that obviously most of your uh, of the audience will know. I mean, it's obviously something that uh, is taken out of uh, the uh, practice of the UK uh, FCA uh, uh, with regards to um, uh, financial projects uh, and fintech projects, etc. Uh, but I think the idea is that um, we'll, we'll have to provide some form of uh, space uh, uh, for the industry to experiment. Uh, with uh, new business formats that could aim to realize more quickly and efficiently uh, sustainability goals uh, and will we, we, we'll involve cooperation between competing uh, undertakings. And to a certain extent, uh, uh, this uh, is something that has worked very well in the context of the uh, financial regulation um, and possibly could help in the context of also promoting uh, the uh, legal certainty that is needed for certain type of investments that are in the gray in the gray zone, and and I think this also hints to a different type of conception of what will be the work of a competition authority. I mean, usually competition authorities are thought as uh, um, somehow having mostly a sanctioning role uh, for anti-competitive practice, and obviously this is a very important part of our work and a significant part of our work in order to create deterrence, which is absolutely needed. But I think also competition authorities should be part in the discussion, let's say at the uh, beginning of these important uh, uh, transformational uh, uh, situations we're facing now. For instance, if we're moving towards the creation of new platforms uh, in the context of sustainability, it's better for a competition authority to have a contribution at the designing phase of that particular platform rather than come uh, uh, later exposed when basically uh, we have seen really the effects uh, that have been produced in the marketplace, it is very difficult to reverse. Huh? So I think uh, in, in these moments of transformational 
let's say, a change that we're seeing right now because we are actually shifting towards uh, the green growth and the digital obviously uh, growth as well that we have discussed. Competition authorities should play a proactive role, uh, a prophylactic role, let's put it that way, so as to make sure that competition principles will be part of the discussion in the way actually these new business models of the sustainability uh, uh, oriented economy will be uh, designed. And I think uh, yeah, can I, can place I, the sandbox yeah. could be a, a way forward towards that. Yeah. What I was going to say is building on that, we, we, we haven't got too much time left. Um, I, I'd, I'd like to suggest that each of the panelists suggest um, an area where they think that collaboration, cooperation ought to be encouraged and, and which probably might be case studies or case examples of the type you're talking about. But, but while you're thinking about that, can I just put to you the question or put to all of you the question that's come from Ben? I was wondering if any of the panelists has an opinion on the seeming discrepancy between the US and the EU on implementing sustainability in the competitive assessment. I have the impression the EU is much further in, ahead in developing this criteria in antitrust as opposed to the US, or am I missing something? Um, uh, Simon, do, do you have a view on that? Um, only a very high level one, and that is basically to agree with the, the, the comment. It does seem that on this particular issue, the EU is ahead. Um, but I mean, I think there is signs that the rest of the world is certainly interested. If you look at some of the, inter the conferences and stuff I've been on, you're getting delegates coming in from all around the world. Um, so there is interest there. And uh, with the change with the administration in the United States, um, I think it's all to play for. If you look at some of the recent appointees, um, they're not people who I know have been specifically in interested in sustainability, but they're certainly people on, shall we say, the more progressive end of um, the competition or spectrum. So um, I would anticipate that things will change. And look how quickly things developed in the last um, 18 months in Europe. I would anticipate there'll be change in the United States. At least it will become a hot topic. Whether that results in concrete changes is another matter, but we're still looking for concrete changes here in Europe. Very good. Um, uh, so I'd like to ask you to, to, to come up with examples of, of areas where, you know, we think we, 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 we can do better. I mean, I, I'll give you an example, a parochial example. In the UK, it drives me bonkers that every local authority in this country has different rules for recycling. Why on earth isn't there a national system so everyone knows that paper goes into black boxes and glass goes into green boxes and we have the same boxes or bins right across the country? We don't. We have a different system in each local authority. And that ought to be a collaboration between the companies that do the waste collection, in our case, a company called Viridor, which is part of Suez. Um, and and the, the, the local authorities, you know, probably with heads knocked together by the central government. So that's my example. But um, Jackie, yeah. Salome, have you got some examples? Yeah, well, I mean, I think I think the clearest example for me was slightly spoken about Salome earlier, which would be companies deciding to adopt a greener version of products that's going to cost more money. And so it's going to result in higher prices to consumers who are buying those goods, but will result in benefits to the environment. And um, perhaps the sort of recipients of the benefits are not the people who actually bought the product, and perhaps they're even future generations of consumers. And I think that's when it gets really difficult from um, a legal perspective right now. You can be creative in the way that Simon suggests earlier, but there would be a niggle about, well, what if the authority does not interpret it that way? Would there be a risk of fines later? Salome. Yeah, uh, I, I think there are so many examples, actually. Um, I briefly referred to, um, you know, some of the examples that I have been uh, personally working on. And, and again, so about, uh, you know, research and development. To me, research and development, which is, you know, is ultimately also promoting innovation. Um, but of course, there are risks. And you were referring to the hesitation of, of some companies to really get into this kind of collaboration for obvious reasons, right? But the benefits are there and research and development agreements trying mm -hmm. to find new technologies that will increase uh, the greener aspects uh, that will uh, limit pollution, et cetera, are clearly, clearly uh, there, but also, you know, standard setting, right? Um, to improve the environment, et cetera. 
so I think you can apply so many, so many. Now, I wanted to make just one point that I, I forgot to mention, and was also briefed heard by Jackie and, and Yanis, which is, um, and also by you in the sense that if you, when you say, okay, companies are reticent, um, have some uh, issues into, and you were referring, and I, I, I took note like, uh, we're having some hesitation in terms of entering into this kind, kind of collaboration. Now we are trying, and, and probably Jackie as well, and the private practice to help them, to encourage them to come to us, but also to potentially go to the competition authority to get some guidance. And it is true that um, there is a lot of hesitation because nobody wants to be the first one to <laughs> potentially get a, a negative um, feedback. Um, but there is room uh, there to be done. Uh, that we, need to, we need to do that. We need to accompany them. We need to help them uh, design also a system to uh, limit potential risk in terms of information <clears throat> exchange, uh, also finding ways to really document all the benefits, um, measure them. Um, try, we have even involved economists um, in, in one particular example. So there are ways, I think we are all working on that and uh, to precisely, as you say, try to bring these examples, these um, models of uh, cooperation to the competition authority to get there. Uh, is, 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 is that because there does seem to be a fear of going to talk to people. I mean, look at Yanis. He's a perfectly friendly sort of chap. You know you can pick up the phone <laughs> and ask him anything. <laughs> you know, why, why are people so afraid of talking to the authorities? Is it because they think they, it's become a very confrontational, litigious society? Is it that? People are afraid of, you know, getting involved in any way with authorities? Is it because they fear that if they start talking, they'll give away something they shouldn't give away? I do feel that there have been times in the past where people were much more collaborative with the authorities um, and, and, and not have this, this confrontational approach. And it shouldn't be a confrontational approach. You know, the, the competition authorities, they're not um, in, the, in Europe, they're not a, a, normally a prosecutor. You know, it, it should be a, a, a bipartite, bipartite or tripartite, tripartite discussion to achieve the right result. So, I mean, Yanis, I think I put the question to you. You know, th that I think is, is something we all need to, to develop is to really encourage the private sector practitioners and in-house um, to, to engage more and vice versa. Uh, yes, I mean, I, I will agree with that. And obviously uh, this is part of a strategy a communication strategy of each competition authority to uh, somehow yeah. reach out to different stakeholders. and. Let's, let's also not forget that the stakeholders here are not just businesses. Huh? So there are consumer groups, there are also uh, other stakeholders like environmental uh, groups that should be brought into the discussion because obviously, as Simon was saying before, uh, the whole discussion should be uh, some form of cover uh, greenwashing huh, of cartels. Uh, and obviously there are uh, limits uh, that should not be, uh, be crossed. But uh, I think that as mentioned before, competition authorities uh, should be open to discussion. That's also, I think, why we need to develop tools that uh, enable us to have a discussion. For instance, the sandbox is, I think, a great tool because us, for instance, with the, um, the FCA, I mean, the FCA actually uh, in, uh, puts into, play, uh, into place uh, for every round of sandbox a number of eligibility criteria. And this could probably be also various sectors of activity where we think that uh, there is a, a, a lack of investment uh, and we need somehow to nudge basically businesses to uh, enter into this area. So that could be quite an interesting way of, of nudging them uh, from that perspective. It will also, I think, require uh, the competition authority to discuss with other regulatory authorities, because obviously the uh, competition uh, law enforcement is not the only risk that yeah. these investments may face. Huh? It might be one of the uh, of a virus risk and probably not the most important one. Uh, and, and therefore, I think uh, that's why also in our uh, report, we also suggested a common advice unit uh, that uh, could probably you know, help the sandbox uh, uh, unit at the competition authority and, be, uh, uh, um, um, and have representatives from the various uh, uh, regulatory authorities uh, that could possibly be uh, involved in, in different projects. For instance, if we have a round on uh, uh, focusing on energy, renewable energy, maybe, you know, the uh, representative of the uh, regulatory energy authority could be part 
of that common advice unit. If next year is something else, you know, I don't know about. Yeah, uh, yeah. And it's, um, sorry to interrupt you again, but I mean, sorry. there's a question here which sort of feeds into what you were saying from Victoria Robertson. At what stage of the competition assessment should we attempt to reconcile concerns related to environmental sustainability and, for example, data uh, protection or consumer very, protection? I mean, you know, it's this balancing, isn't it? Yeah, it's a very interesting question because the, the level where you're doing it, in, I mean, we think about Article 1.1, but that's not the only mm. uh, provision, of course. I mean, there's a huge discussion right now about if this should be done at a 101 paragraph one level, where basically the burden of proof we know is uh, at the com uh, competition authority, basically, uh, and uh, or at the, uh, Article 101 uh, three, uh, where uh, the burden of proof is basically uh, mostly on um, on the on the on the companies. Uh, but I think you know, the, as usually, you know, the, uh, uh, it's better to combine both. I mean, uh, there are some type of concerns uh, that could be taken into account in 101 part of one, and I think the recent case law, uh, in particular, the opening of the uh, of the analysis into the context of um, restrictions by of competition by object uh, by uh, by the court in uh, in the recent case law in Budapest Bank and Generics, um, uh, you know, plus with the possible uh, in the contribution of the older case law, I mean, and Walter's kind of related case law, uh, could provide some interesting uh, possibilities in that context. And talking about also other tools, I mean, uh, the possibility of issuing no action letters is also something that could help uh, in a certain context. Huh? And um, I'm not saying I'm not in favor of the uh, retour of comfort letters. Uh, uh, as such, but I think you know what we have seen also with COVID mm -hmm. is that no action enforcement letters could be very useful. I will not be in favor of excluding sectors. I think that's probably, and obviously I, I, there's no judgment here to my UK colleagues. I mean, I, I, you know, they might have their reasons, but I think generally this is usually like something to be avoided, um, of course, unless necessary. Uh, but I think you know, uh, no action enforcement letters could possibly be um, be useful in that context and. Let me also answer the question asked about the US. I think um, maybe the US will probably be slower just because of the fact that the main um, the assessment, the enforcement system in the US is mostly based on private enforcement rather than public yeah. enforcement. Yeah. And I think, uh, uh, and this will take them more time to make the shift uh, of their case law uh, than uh, the opportunities that we have in Europe through the block exemption regulation, the guidelines at the EU level, uh, or you know, the national competition authorities guidelines, et cetera, like Dutch or our initiatives in Greece to somehow uh, push the debate forward into that context. So I uh, think probably from that perspective, institutional structure might be an advantage. Yeah, I, I mean, I, 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 have, I have no doubt if we had another three or four hours, we could actually resolve all the problems and, and, and tell everyone how, how, how to sort out the world. But uh, the, 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 the clock is ticking. And, um, I, you know, we said an hour and a quarter, we're at an hour and a quarter. Um, I, I, I just think that um, we ought to start winding down. And um, can, can we just go in reverse order to, to, to for any of the other three of you to have a, a final word? So if, if we go Jackie, Salome, and then Simon. Jackie, any, any final word from you? I mean, I, I, we all appreciate your, your input, but uh, and I know there's a great deal more all of you could have said. <laughs> No, I think it's been a really interesting discussion. I, I think it's such an interesting topic. And I hope that most people would agree that the sustainability initiatives should be allowed to go ahead <laughs> in some form or other. So I'm going to be an optimist and hope that between us over the coming years, we do find some solutions. It's very exciting what Yanis has been telling us going on with it. I like the idea of the sandbox in Greece. And if that's successful, maybe that will be the way forward. Let's see. <laughs> Good. Salome. Oh, oh, here we go. So uh, for me, I mean, I just want to echo uh, Jackie. I mean, this has been a, a fantastic discussion. Uh, we are just, um, there, there is going to be so much more and uh, there's so much more that can be done. So I'm really excited about the, 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 the initiatives at national level, at private level. And um, my big ask here, and you know, goes to you, Yanis. I mean, trying to get a harmonize some sort of a, um, level playing field across Europe, and uh, and that covers not just the European Union, obviously the European Union, but I think European Union and the CMA they need to get together, and mm. we need harmonized approach on this. There is no Brexit doesn't count for these purposes. Yeah, yeah, quite right. 
Quite right. well said. Simon. As I said, I, I believe we already have the necessary legal tools, mm. and therefore there is no reason why either the for, for the authorities not to be able to give um, more guidance and be more positive on uh, in relation to these issues. Business rightly hears so often what they can't do, but they also yeah. need to hear what they, what can, they can do. do. Yeah. And it's incumbent upon business as well and advisors to give robust advice, yeah. whether you're in-house or out-house. An example I didn't give, you were asking for examples, will be something like the Fair, Fair Wear Foundation, an opinion that was published um, and behind the scenes had European Commission support for the introduction of a living wage for workers in textile factories. Now that's not an environmental sustainability argument, but if something like that can be found to be um, not a target for competition authorities and to be compliant if it were looked at, then a fortiori, the sort of things that we've been talking about today. So my, my sort of parting message is really, you know, courage. Um, we should give more robust advice and we, the authority should be more robust in uh, and more confident in setting out what we can do. Yeah, no, I think that's a very, very good message. Very, very good message. So uh, uh, we got the legal tools, but we need to 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 work much more constructively with the tools we've got. Uh, I apologise to those of you who've who, who've asked questions we haven't specifically answered. Um, most recently, uh, Tim Cowan, but. Uh, he and I know each other and I'll deal with his separately, but I think you, you've probably all seen his, his question and Claudia's and there are probably some others I've missed, but I'm really grateful. I mean, it's a, I think a, a fascinating subject is terribly important. Uh, we've got some top guys on the panel, so well done all of you. I'm, I'm most grateful to you. Uh, and um, uh, given um, uh, who was Salome's comment earlier, that uh, she was the representative of the non-Brits. I think I, I, I take that to mean that the two Yanises are, are honorary Brits because they're, they're both got roles with, with British universities. So, so welcome to the club, you two. <laughs> and Salome, I'm sure we'd love to welcome you as well. But thank you all very much. I think a, a, a great event. Um, Yanis Kokoris, uh, any final remark before we, before we uh, shut down? Just to thank you, Michael, for excellent sharing in this event and all the speakers on behalf of the British Institute uh, and all our attendees. And we will be in touch with uh, further details about our future webinars. Thank you so much, all. Good. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank Lovely you. to see you. Thank, thank you, you all very much. Bye -bye. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.